morning, Jay Clark. Welcome to Walk This Way. I'm really excited to have Lindsay Swartz here as a guest. Lindsay, welcome. Thanks, Dwayne. So you are an incredible restaurateur. Your family goes back decades now being in the restaurant industry. Before we get into your business, tell us a little bit about how you grew up, where you grew up, what you did, your parents, those kinds of things. Yeah, well, it's, it's tied really to, to you know, where I am today and tied to the career. I uh, grew up on Mercer Island, and the first restaurant that my dad did was in Bellevue. It was called The Butcher Restaurant in Bellevue uh, in 1970. Wow. So I was three years old when that restaurant opened. What was the concept of The Butcher? Um, it was like a neighborhood steakhouse and salad bar, if you remember the keg. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of started around the same time, and that, right. that was a hot concept, an idea back in those days. And that, that was a hot place, I remember. Yeah. You know, the butcher was like the place to go. What, what do you think made it so successful? Well, part of it, and the reason that they put it there is that there was nothing going on in that part of Bellevue, you know, right. which seems funny now because Bellevue's turned into a, to a big city. But, right. but back in, in you know, the late 60s, it was a, a small town, and really any action that there was was west of 405, where Bellevue Square is now right. and right. where downtown Bellevue is now. But right. east of 405, there was nothing. I mean, literally, when, when they were building the restaurant, um, it was across the street from a pasture that had horses and cows. Yeah, I remember and, people just telling me yesterday that they were riding horses in Bellevue in yeah. the 1980s. Yeah, so I mean, as yeah. a little kid, I remember having fun going with my dad, like on weekends to see the restaurant under construction, and yeah. then walking across this, and the street, by the way, was a dirt road, wow. walking across the dirt road, and we could reach through the fence and pet the horses and the cows, <laughs> and um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, now, in that same spot is a bunch of uh, office buildings that are, that are Microsoft buildings right. and stuff. Right, but so, I mean, that's a big risk. I mean, you're essentially building a cow pasture, yeah. you know, where yeah. outside of the core of the business. Yeah. What What do you think gave your dad the courage to do that, and then what made it so successful? Well, he he was working with his uncle, um, Jack Benaroy is his uncle, and Jack was starting out in the real estate development business, and so Jack had a business park that he was developing, um, that was going to be warehouse office. And my dad worked for Jack right. Uh, right out of college. He went to University of Washington, and, and he was leasing um, the space in the, in the business park. And they weren't having much success because um, people didn't want to be out in the middle of nowhere. Right, you, you right. Know, as funny as that sounds. So, um, so, so they, they decided maybe if we put a restaurant in this business park, it'll bring, people it'll, bring it'll it'll bring tenants, it'll bring office, you know, and right. warehouse tenants to the space because at least they have somewhere to eat. So that was, it wasn't like they had this this dream uh -huh. to open a restaurant. It was kind of out of necessity to try to complement the uh, the development. So it was almost it almost was by accident that my dad got into the restaurant business. Yeah, because he had no he had no background. In he food wanted to be in real estate. I mean, right. he were, he worked for his uncle. And the, and the Ben Royals are institutions in this town. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they are now. I mean, yeah. they were. That was really in the early phases of that company too. But yeah, I think that was probably my dad's ambition. You know, when he went right. to college and, and studied business <clears throat> and real estate, and thought he would be a real estate guy. And and um, but but then the restaurant, it, it, you know, it just happened. And, and again, because you know, there were people that lived in Bellevue. There just wasn't. Um, stuff to do in that part right. of town and so that became the hot spot you know for for really all of east bellevue and and there was i guess a, a, apparently a pent-up demand because they were busy right away i mean we've we've built lots of restaurants over the years and uh, some of them take a long time to you know kind of build up to scale but that one was busy right out of the gate because people were so excited there was something so to what, do. what was the secret sauce I mean, what was the recipe that, that that made it so was it just there was a lack of competition or did they do something really special i mean they had a lot going for them because there was a lack of competition and a mm -hmm. pent-up demand but i think that you know the reason we've been around now almost 50 years is um is, is i think they you know my dad and my uncle uh, has just had an understanding from from day one about the importance of taking care of of the customer, taking care mm -hmm. of the guest, and taking care of the employees. We call mm -hmm. them team members, and so sure. I think that the that that's if you ask for a secret to our success, I think it's been that. Yeah, because restaurants, I mean, the failure rate's off the chart, right? Off the so, charts. so I mean, to say you've been around fifty years, that's an incredible accomplishment. 
Yeah. So was was the butcher a one off, or did you try to scale that? Uh, there, so there, <clears throat> so uh, same model happened again. Jack built a uh, a, a development in South Seattle, um, the Design Center, Seattle Design Center. Okay. And so they took that same model. They put a butcher in the Design Center. Um, and the design center it has a beautiful um, atrium surrounded by showrooms, um, design showrooms. And so they also did, the butcher uh, did catering in the atrium oh. space. And that was um, a really unique space. You know, this was still in the 70s. Yeah. Um, you know, back in those days, really, if you wanted to have an event, it would be in a, in a hotel kind of right. a ballroom downtown Seattle. There, you know, there weren't all the cool different kinds of venues that we have now for parties. And so, right. um, so the atrium became a, a really unique uh, destination event space. And that was real successful for a long time. So, so did you kind of grow up I mean, going to the restaurant, working in the restaurants, yeah. being the dishwasher. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your path in the restaurant. Yeah. Industry. So, well, like I said, I mean, I, I had fond memories, you know, from the age of three years old, just going and petting the horses, seeing the restaurant get built, right. uh, being there on opening night when right. it opened. It was busy. It was exciting. Uh, my dad, uh, Bill, and my uncle John were always really passionate about the business, and so mm. uh, for for as long as I can remember. I wanted to be part of it. I, I, I was mm. like, man, this this is this would be really cool to get to go do what my dad and my uncle do. And, and um, I mean, I was I was asking them if I could go to work. You know, people say like, oh, you're in a family business. Was there an expectation that you would yeah. do it? I was the one saying to them, hey, when can I when can I start working? Wow. And and they finally let me when I was 13. Uh -huh. um, and I started washing dishes at the butcher. Yeah. Um, and I loved it. I and, loved it. And was there any expectation of that? Did your dad sit you down and say, okay, now if you're going to get in your family business, this is what you got to do? Um, I mean, no, not a, a formal discussion. There were lots of, of comments about, hey, there's pressure on you. Um, you know, if you want to be in the family business, you're going to want to be the guy that works the hardest and puts mm -hmm. in the hours and, and, and you want people to see you as a, as a standard bearer. Yeah. And somebody that's you know living the the company culture, and right. so there was there was more uh, from from both my dad and my uncle, like you know that those kinds of expectations. So I mean, they really wanted people to know that you weren't just handed something that you'd work for it, and that's the reason that you yeah. Well, I think they it. wanted that they they wanted that for me. They wanted me to right. to have that kind of um, of pride in, in what I did and right. sense of accomplishment. So I think you know they they were saying that to to help me. Uh, be more successful and feel successful. And and at any point did you deviate? And say I'm. I think I may be an engineer or you know a fireman or was it always straight down the middle? Uh, no, I did. You know, in the same way that I that I loved mm -hmm. the restaurant business and the excitement of the restaurant business, I loved the excitement of just uh, having a business. Just the like seeing a business start and scale up. Um, there was just something about that, you you know, yeah. right? And yeah. so I always thought, um, boy, I have this cool opportunity and, and, and amazing opportunity to be part of a family business, but it'd also be really cool to start something on my own right. and start something from scratch. And so, uh, you know, I've always kind of had a, a, a drive to do that and, 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 I, and I guess a bit of a struggle. Um, but I've I've been able to kind of satisfy that that part of me within the family business just by starting new, new ventures concepts. and new things and new concepts. Yeah. yeah. So then you went to college. You, you went down south. To, uh -huh, I went to USC. To USC. Uh -huh. And and what'd you major in? Uh, well, business. Uh, business administration with an emphasis on entrepreneurial studies and, and at the time that I went to school that was the only school in the country that had that that entrepreneur program wow. and so that was that was the thing that that really was appealing to me and now I think a lot of universities do uh, probably yeah. the majority and it's such a great thing so I, I was you know even back at that age in high school deciding where to go to college I knew I wanted to go somewhere where I could learn a, about was that a good experience for you it was fantastic. Yeah. It was. It's such a. It's a, a great cool school. Thing. I I taught. I don't know if you know this, but I taught at USC. Yeah, I remember you telling me that. Yeah, That's yeah. Great. It's a the longevity it's great. school. So yeah, Andrew School of, of Longevity. So, yeah. so you get out of college. Where is the company at that point where you get out of college? So uh, we still had the butcher, the two butchers. We had uh, bought a, a restaurant called Benjamin's that was in Bellevue on top of the Key Bank Tower. Right. 
Funny story about that is it was on the ninth floor of the Key Bank Tower, which was the tallest building in Bellevue. The ninth floor was the tallest building. And we oh. had, uh, there was a whole ad campaign that was, you know, come dine nine floors up. Yeah. You know, and a, and a picture of, of, wow. of that. And like, uh, that was uh, such a big deal. And that building is still there now. There's uh -huh. not a restaurant on top of it anymore, but you look around, it's just surrounded. There must be yeah, 30 my, or 40, 50 story, 50 buildings. story buildings. <laughs> yeah. It's like the tiniest little building. Yeah. So, and, and you know, that was, 30 years ago. Wow. Um, so so we, we had we bought um, the Benjamins in Bellevue, uh, uh, you know, in the 80s, which was when I got out of school. Yeah. In the late 80s, we had opened a, a second Benjamins on South Lake Union, which is where Daniel's broiler is now. We had we right. converted that in 2000. Um, and we were just starting a concept, Kachina Kachina Italian Cafe, uh, that started in, in 87. Yeah, let's talk about that, because that blew yeah. up. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, that really went nationwide. Yeah. And, well, and not nationwide, but regional. Regional, well, Yeah, okay. West Coast, yeah. So how, how, how many Kachina Kachinas did you have? Oh my God, I, I want to say 33. Okay. I hope I got that right, but it's somewhere yeah. in that number. Yeah, and what was, was the concept number. for Kachina Kachina? Um, well, it was, if you know, uh, California Pizza Kitchen. Right. So we started r right around the same time. I mean, just kind of coincidentally, my dad was, was fraternity brothers for a while with, with the guy that started, Cal one of the guys that started California Pizza Kitchen. Okay. So kind of at the same time, um, had, you know, the, 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 the wood um, fire oven pizzas, right. um, kind of a, a, a casual um, but hip concept, great, great pizza and Italian food. Um, I think what was differentiated Kachina from California Pizza Kitchen was Kachina had uh, cool bars. I mean, kind of in addition to being, I mean, it was a, it was a cool mix because it was a, like a really family fun um, restaurant with a really hip trendy kind of a bar. I remember so, it was very colorful. There yeah, all kinds yeah, of colors and yeah, stuff. colorful and, and Italian, almost like polka music, but right. they, they pulled it off to, yeah. to sound super cool. Like a party cool. atmosphere. Yeah, so, um, so that first one was on South Lake Union, and uh, it was widely successful. We did another one in Bellevue, uh, South Center, and then that, that became a spin-off of Schwartz Brothers. So we, 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 we pulled those stores out of the, the main company, Schwartz Brothers Restaurants, and raise some money with the intention of scaling that that up. Were they franchised at all? Uh, there was one franchise at Knott's Berry Farm, but, okay. but all the rest were company owned. And, and was the goal to take that public or to flip it or what? Uh, well, the goal was to scale it up as big as, as possible and, and yeah, with some kind of exit for the investors. And, and so that was part of what kept me excited about staying in the family business was that there was this opportunity is happening right around the time that I I got out of school and um, and I, I was you know struggling with what am I gonna do what am I what's gonna be kind of my space and so this is in the 90s yeah I, I got out of school in 89 so kind of started came came back home and um, and so what we did what I was trying to find kind of my niche in the company and Kachina was really starting to take off um, we started selling products in the grocery stores under the Kachina Kachina label, and that was like that was my baby. Well, the things that we had in the restaurant. So we had a refrigerated pasta sauce okay. that came in a pouch. We had uh, fresh pasta in the refrigerated section. Those were kind of the first two core items. But we expanded that. Uh, we had a really good partnership with QFC, the local mm -hmm. local grocery um, chain that still does a great job. Um, and really, you know, we, we did a, um, the bread that we served was a, a Italian hearth bread called a Toscano bread. We had that in, in the bakery department. Uh, we, we did deli uh, refrigerated pizzas. We did a Italian sausage. Uh, salad dressing. Lots so, of, it, lots oh of yeah, things. lots of things. So it, it was a, it was was a nice a little business. Adventure? Yeah, it was profitable. I mean, it wasn't nearly as big as the restaurant side of the business, but it, it made it made some money, and it was a nice you know complement right. to the to the restaurants and, it and created advertising, brand right? Branding. So, yeah. so that kind of was how I was able to satisfy my entrepreneurial side, but also <laughs> the the desire to stay in the family. So, business. How, how was it for you and your family? I mean, you you went from running four or five restaurants. And, and, and you know a lot of our viewers are interested in scale. Uh -huh. So now you're you know you you run the four or five restaurants for probably you know twenty years, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, we're going to go to thirty three. Yeah. And yeah. and so tell us about the lessons learned and what was good and what was bad and what was painful. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, there's so many different 
obstacles to overcome when you scale up. I think um, just the geography, mm -hmm. you know, going from a a company where where the you know the owners the executives could drive to right. any of the properties in in ten or twenty minutes right. uh, versus you got to get on a plane or stay in a hotel or so you it just you're not able to to spend as much time in the stores it's harder to get to yeah. and so to to keep the continuity of of the company culture. Um, that becomes a lot of work and, and um, I mean I just have so much admiration and respect for people who have done that. You, yeah. You've done it and some of our other friends and I think um, you know that's something that maybe um, we could have been more prepared to, to understand and, and figure out how to do so I think we gave it a good shot and, and um, that, that's a huge point though because yeah. people really fail to think about geography yeah. and there are so many issues uh, kind of embedded in geography. First of all, the culture, the political, you yeah, know, yeah. knowledge, or is it a more conservative town, more liberal yeah, town? Sure. You know, what's the employment situation? Mm -hmm. But the, the drive-by, the owner drive-by thing is huge. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, we have 20 locations now in Seattle. We have uh, almost 20 outside of Seattle. And the ones outside of Seattle are about twice as much work. Yeah, and so you have to think. Everybody's like, well, "Let's go scale in this." You know, you think, "Well, we don't know any of the contractors. We don't know any of the subs. We don't know the people that license us." Right. You know, all these obstacles that I think you know the listeners out there need to consider, as opposed to, "Hey, after building, you know, being built right here down the street, I can drive by and talk to the superintendent yeah. every day." That's a huge it's risk huge. factor. Absolutely, I mean that's that's a big lesson I've learned over the years yeah. for sure. And, yeah. and and in our in our business, in the restaurant business, it's also so um, just eating, eating habits, right? right. I mean, like you, we kind of know how our friends and where we go to eat and what, what how people eat here. And you, you assume, you know, you, you go a couple states away, it's going to be the same. It isn't. I mean, no. I, you know, I would tell you we were in Arizona and Colorado. Um, so, so we we were Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, Colorado, and, and Oregon and California, you know, similar eating eating patterns and yeah. so, and, the, and the menus worked. Um, you know, Arizona, Colorado is kind of more of a Midwest yeah. uh, culture and more of a meat and potatoes. Yeah. And we had these like yeah. hipster kind of California style right. pizzas. Uh, you know, back in those days, you know, something like way out there would be a barbecue chicken pizza right. or a Thai chicken pizza. I mean, they weren't interested yeah. in that. It was like, what do you mean? Meat. Right. Yeah. But it's like, well, geez, people in Seattle and Portland and now LA and San Francisco love this. You know, well, that's, that's not what we like. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's just little nuances that, that you have to it's figure so out. It's so true. Mm -hmm. I, I remember taking our menu that we had in Seattle. This was a, with, with my previous company, and we served all this fresh salmon. Mm -hmm. We went to Colorado, and we served fresh salmon. I go, what? what are you giving us the salmon for? And we're like, right. well, it's fresh salmon. It's great. It's heart healthy. It's good. Hey, we want some ribeye. You know? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> so exactly. And so people really, you know, it's what they grew up with, what's what's the regional food differences, uh -huh. and so on. So that was a big learning for you then. For sure, yeah. for sure. And now, you know, everything we're doing is in the Seattle area. I mean, yeah. we've had more success. You know, not to say we would never venture outside this area again, but, but right. yeah, we would. There, there's a lot of things that, that we would try to understand and try to do differently. I mean, I think a steakhouse concept probably does translate right. uh, better anywhere you go, pretty right. much. In the, yeah, in, it's in universal. The, yeah. Although beef's getting yeah. kind of a bad beef. Yeah, bad, bad, bad it is. Now. You know, yeah. and on that note, um, I mean, you know, we were the first steakhouse in the Seattle area to do a plant-based menu. Wow. And we See, did that uh, six or seven years ago. We just, you know, kind of paying attention to, to trends. Uh, both local trends and also we get a lot of international So you have travelers. a faux steak now at the steakhouse? Well, no, we don't have that yet. We were just talking uh, yesterday about doing a cauliflower steak, oh. but um, but we have um, we have a plant-based uh, um, ravioli pasta. Okay. It's got plant-based cheese in it that's really good. Uh, we do a tofu stir fry. Yeah. Uh, we do a grilled mushroom dish. Um, we've got. Um, uh, like a, a veggie spring roll lumpia yeah. kind of deal. So we have a we have a full menu. I mean, it's not just you know. And it used to be somebody would say, "Hey, do you have anything ve vegetarian?" Oh, we could whip you up some pasta yeah. with some yeah. veggies, and you know, it doesn't make people feel special and right. feel good, which yeah. is what we're trying to do. So yeah. so we developed a whole menu. We're like, "Oh, let us bring you out the plant based menu," and. Uh, 
you know, as, as ironic as it sounds that a steakhouse would be successful with a plant-based menu, it's been a big success for us. And I think a big part of, of us continuing to build our counts when, as you say, there's a lot of people eating less red meat. Yeah. So is, is there any consideration, you know, I, I've been reading all these articles on these, these you know, plant-based steaks now and they're blowing up and my new president's a vegetarian. He's like, man, when you have to taste these hamburgers, they're incredible. Yeah, but, you know, they're awesome, and, by the way. And I haven't, ta- I haven't tried okay, one Okay, so we, we do the Beyond Burger. That's probably what he's talking about. We, yeah. we do have the Beyond Burger at Daniel's. Yeah. And, uh, and what's yeah. in it? What, what's it made of? I mean, I, it, it, it's obviously plant-based. It's veggie-based. Right. Um, I, I don't does know. Does it taste like a real burger? Yeah, it does. You know, I mean, you know how you used to, if you, your option used to be like eating a garden burger, right, and that yeah. was kind of a grainy, uh, I don't know, I never liked them. It was like cardboard. Uh, yeah, no. This this looks like beef. It it, it tastes like it. It, it eats like the it. The texture the of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I eat them. I just had one for dinner at home last night, actually. Wow. And and uh, uh, my wife eats mostly vegetarian. Uh uh-huh. um, And and then yeah, when I go to Daniel's, I order that a lot, especially at lunchtime. It's a great oh. lunch dish. Doesn't fill you up too much. So I just want to circle back and close the loop on yeah. Kachina Kachina. Yeah. So what 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 happened at thirty three? Um, so we were we always did really really well in the Northwest in in, the, in Washington Oregon. Uh, we did all right in California. Didn't do as well in in Colorado Arizona. Uh, it went from you know in in the beginning just rocket ship to the moon you know pace to to kind of got to it was just an okay business because you had the good ones and the not as good ones and the economy kind of started to to go south at, at one point in the 90s. Um, and so we had an opportunity. Wolfgang Puck Worldwide mm. uh, was really scaling up uh, Wolfgang Puck cafes at the time. Right. And they wanted to do those in, all over the place. And so they made a, an offer to buy the company, mm. and, and the timing was right. So we sold the, we sold the Kachina Kachina company to Wolfgang Puck Worldwide. Did, did they scale it? Um, no, they, they, you know, again, the economy started going south. It, right. it probably, I think they bid off more than they could chew. It actually doubled the size, the number of locations in their company when they bought us. And I just don't think they had the infrastructure right. to support it. So they ended up selling, um, ended up selling off the Northwest locations kind of as one off deals. And they converted the Kachinas in California to Wolfgang Puck cafes and, and I don't know, ultimately. Yeah. What happened? So you guys have uh, you have so many different divisions. I mean, at one point you had the Gretchen's mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Shoebox, what's yeah. it called? Yeah, or, Gretchen Shoebox. And um, and now you have Schwartz Brothers Deli. And so tell us about those. Schwartz Brothers business. Bakery. Or, 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 excuse me. Yeah. Bakery. Yeah. So. Um, so the bakery was the first of those two. Uh, we had a concept I didn't mention earlier called the sandwich shop and pie place, and it was uh, kind of a, a cafeteria style. Um, and the, the kind of unique thing about it was that right as he started in the line, we had all these beautiful pies, slices of pie, you know, a dozen or 15 different pies right there in the front. So the idea was, you know, before they even order anything else, you got to grab grab a pie and put it on your tray and walk down and you get your sandwich or your burger. And so we sold a lot of pies. We had a little bakery that made the pies for mm-hmm. the sandwich shops and we had, we had a handful of those. We had the opportunity to, to, to start doing some baked goods for Starbucks back uh, when, when, when they first started. Mm. Uh, they only had 10 stores. So this is so in the early 90s. This is then. in the early 90s. So, wow. the, so the little the little That's pie a good relationship to start <laughs> yeah, out with. Yeah, we were really fortunate. And, and um, the little pie making thousand square foot bakery turned into uh, ultimately, you know, now we've got about uh, 80,000 square feet of production space. Uh, we did we did products for Starbucks for about 20 years. All and what, what kind of stuff did you do for Starbucks? Anything that you see in there, still see in there today, croissants, muffins, cookies, tea loaves. Um, wow. Everything, every, every, anything you would see in a coffee shop, or like what you have at Queen V. Right. Yeah. Um, and and so we still we don't do Starbucks anymore, but we still do those same types of products for other coffee shops yeah. uh, and and grocery. We kind of had to reinvent that business from a from a private label co-packer to uh, we we launched the Schwartz Brothers Bakery brand, uh-huh. and now uh, we have branded items in just about every major. Uh, grocery chain in the Northwest. So which which is bigger, the bakery division or the <clears throat> restaurant division? You know, coincidentally, they're right about the same size. Really? They just They just kind of worked out that way. Wow. So that's about where they are at the moment. There's been years where one is bigger than the other, but right now they're about the same size. And how many employees in each? Uh, about... 250 in each in each so yeah about so we're about we're around 500 a little over yeah. 500 right now 
So, so that was the bakery business. And then uh, we bought a business from Nordstrom. Nordstrom, uh, for a very short time, wanted to get into the kind of the corporate catering business. Yeah. And they were doing uh, like a boxed lunch. Wasn't in, Bob Love the head of that, the ex-NBA Sonic player? I don't even know. My yeah, dad I, I would know. I think he was. Maybe. Yeah. But they, it was kind of a cute idea. They had a boxed lunch, and it was in a Nordstrom shoebox. Yeah. So it was, I, I'm sure a big part of that was just a branding thing for them. So they were delivering these lunches. In, in Nordstrom shoe boxes, yeah. and it didn't, it wasn't a great business for them, and so they decided to sell that business, and we bought it and, and kind of kept on the shoe box name. So we, so we changed it from Nordstrom Shoe Box Express to Gretchen's Shoe Box Express. Gretchen Mathers was a partner of ours uh, on the catering side of our business, uh -huh. and she, um, she became a partner on the bakery side and on the food production side. So, and that business ended up at the end was the biggest of all three divisions really? of the company. And, um, what, what do you think made it so successful? Starbucks again. I mean, really? We were doing the lunches uh -huh. for, for Starbucks for, for yeah. a long time and, and just, yeah, we just kind of were So able strategic to... relationships are huge. Then. Huge. Yeah. Well, they're huge, but there's a lesson to be learned um, in, in not having all your eggs in one basket. So it's, so. it's the 800 pound gorilla. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's great business when you have it, but, but you're, you're always at risk of losing it yeah. and you better have a plan B. And, um, you know, we almost didn't at, at the bakery when we, when, when the Starbucks business went away. So we, you have all this infrastructure that's based on this guy doing 80% of your business. Exactly. And then they say, Oh, tomorrow you're not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what happened when that happened? Well, like I said, we had, we, yeah, we had to reinvent ourselves and, 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 you know, like you said, we had these assets. I mean, we had equipment that made, you know, these beautiful products. We had a, a knowledge of how to make products and, and to scale. I mean, we were, um, you know, we, we, we were and still are um, very competitive in, in, as a regional bakery for making high quality products at a great price. Uh, what, what Starbucks got to a point where they needed a national they needed national vendors that could handle that kind of scale, and that's not who who we are. Um, but so we had we had to say, okay, well, what what other needs are there for a, for a, a regional, a, 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 a high uh, efficient regional high quality bakery? And and we said, well, it's grocery stores. I mean, grocery mm -hmm. um, they they buy regionally. They want fresh baked products, right. and so we just we just got after it. We just pounded the pavement. And we went and found customers and basically said yes to whatever anybody wanted, you know, just, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you want that? We'll figure out how to make it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it took... Um, but that's know. a great story. That's a great testament to the fact that when something bad happens, you just don't fold. you got to pivot and then you have to go aggressively go after yeah. the customer yeah. and meet their needs as opposed to having selling just what you've always done, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, and, and it makes you better. I mean, it makes you stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah, absolutely. And so we learned a lot, and I think we do a lot of things a lot more efficiently than we did because we, we, we had to. Right, yeah. yeah. And then where, where are you guys today? How many restaurants? So we're down, you know, we're, we're really kind of in the process of simplifying the business. And so we've always been a, a, um, a company that's had multiple concepts, like you said. And, and it's hard. I mean, it's fun, right. but it's hard. It's risky. Um, and, and so we've kind of started moving towards let's go with what we're best at. And, and simplified down to, to focusing on the brands that are most successful and then try to scale just those brands. And so those two brands are Daniel's Broiler mm -hmm. and Schwartz Brothers Bakery. So, so on the restaurant side, we have just four Daniel's Broiler locations. And then the bakery, we, we've still got, um, we got two production facilities. It's a, a total of about 80,000 square so, feet. So how many uh, restaurant concepts, and you did the 33 Cucinas, you've done Benjamin's and Gretchen's. And so, I mean, w w how many different concepts have you had? Oh 50 God. or more than 50 or? I don't think more than 50, but I'll bet uh, certainly over 20. Well, yeah, 33. Maybe. Well, you're saying how, how many individual how many, locations? Yeah, oh, yeah. for sure over 50. Yeah, I thought you meant like how many yeah. brands. But yeah, oh yeah, we've had over, over 50. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. How, you know, going back to the simplifying the concept, uh -huh. you know, you started out saying you had this entrepreneur degree, you had uh -huh. this entrepreneur spirit, uh -huh. you know, you and I share that in terms of we're serial entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. how, do you, how do you scratch that itch 
while at the same token saying, hey, we have to do what makes the most sense, you know. Is that just aging, as you say? Well, I think part, of know, it, part of it is I getting learned banged that. over the head enough times. Yeah, yeah. And you say, "Hey, I'm going to sacrifice my entrepreneurial spirit to do what makes money and makes sense." Or yeah. how do you balance that? I think you just have to 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 maybe redefine what what the entrepreneurial spirit is. I mean, I think at least for me, it, it, the entrepreneurial spirit is not necessarily. I'm, I, I think I can do everything. I, oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that. Uh, it's more like I know what I can do. Right. I know what my skill set is and what, what the experience that I have with, w that will guide me to, to being successful at certain things and, and just trying to, to go with that and still be entrepreneurial within what you're doing. I mean, it's still entrepreneurial if we can scale up the Daniels Broiler brand uh, concept and do more locations. It's entrepreneurial at the bakery right. if we can go find new product lines, new customers, um, and so that you know, that's the entrepreneurial side of it. Doesn't mean we have to go try to invent something brand new. So you you feel like you're still in that entrepreneurial mode within your brands that you yeah. define. For sure, or even like I said, just getting excited about doing a plant-based menu right, uh, right. at a steakhouse. You know, it's just yeah. things like that that still get me excited. Yeah, I, I think something you said is really important about realize your own skill set and what you do well. Uh -huh. And I think sometimes people get over their skis and uh -huh. say, "Oh, this would be cool, or this would be sexy, or this would be fun," and they don't have the competency, the competencies, the core competencies to execute on that. Yeah. And I think that's where people get in trouble. And yeah. it sounds like. Through your aged wisdom, you've learned that lesson. So yeah, I hope so. How, you have family members in the business. Mm -hmm. How how is that? What advice would you give for people that are bringing family into the business? Is there a requirement, or do you make them? You know, I, I know for my kids, when they left college, I said, okay, when you get out of college, if you want to work for the company, you have to go work for a billion dollar plus company for two years first, mm -hmm. and then we'll consider you. And if you can, my son was. Uh, at 23, a manager at Microsoft, and he came to Aegis, and he was making, I think, $78,000. And I said, he said, well, what am I going to make, 80, 85? I said, no, you're going to make $11 an hour. Mm -hmm. He's like, Dad, don't, stop kidding me. Don't be ridiculous, you know? And, and he, I said, no, this is what you got to do if you're going to be in the family company, and you're going to wipe bottoms, you know, for the first year. Yeah. And he was, uh, I rate an understatement. But, yeah. you know, a big thing for us is winning over the respect and admiration of your coworkers, uh -huh. and we were going to let kids waltz in to be vice president. So, uh -huh. you know, what kind of rules, regulations, advice do you have about family? Well, we don't have, I'd say, a lot of rules and regulations, and we probably should, and, I, and that's something we talk about, and I think something that as we um, transition from a second generation to third generation, because now uh, my sister's two sons uh, work at the Daniels in, in Bellevue uh, wow. as, as bussers, so they're third generation mm -hmm. uh, family members, and I think that'll probably be the time where we get maybe more formal um, with some of the things you're talking about, about having some, some, some rules of, of how it works. But I think uh, we've been such a growth company all these years, and, and, um, and so, so we don't have, have, have those in place. But in terms of how to be successful and successfully incorporate people in, uh, you know, I feel so fortunate that, that my dad and, and my uncle mm -hmm. and my other uncle, my dad has, a, has another brother in, in the business, Michael, and, and so I learned so much from all three right. of those guys growing up, um, and, and, and I would say, you know, all three of them always made me feel important, feel special. Uh, I could tell they cared about me and, and, and they wanted me so it's to more be of an innate successful. Cultural thing. I think so. I mean, I think that as I now have, have moved into the role of the older guy and, and the opportunity to mentor you know, my younger brothers and, and, and my nephews, um, I really am focused on trying to be like that, trying to be a mentor, trying to make sure that I'm making them feel cared mm -hmm. about and important and welcome. Um, because that that did so much for me, mm -hmm. and and but you have to make that effort. At least right. I do. I mean, because you're in the rat race and you're working, and and, and, right. and they become an employee. And you're like, yeah, hey, I needed to do this and do that. Um, and and I, I think for me, I need to remember to take the time that you mm -hmm. know they're not just an employee. 
uh, they're part of the family and, and they have a care level and they want to be uh, in a leadership kind of role and so in, in, in addition to just maybe mentoring them on, on the job descriptions and the tasks that they need to do in their job, I, I want to make an effort to mentor them to be leaders. Well, you're invested in the next generation. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's almost like putting equity into the company. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of one of the things, um, you know, both my my daughter runs our um, philanthropy division. Our son's a vice president now. After made vice president after 20 years with the company. Yeah. So we made him earn it. But it's about how long it took me. <laughs> yeah. It? Yeah. Well, yeah. Your dad made you earn it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, one of the things that I'm excited about that. Uh, we brainstorm as a family is how do you let the third generation know about the history and the culture uh -huh. and you know you you have kids I have grandkids you know I'm much older than you but I have nine grandkids now wow so in two weeks we're launching our first grandkids Academy that's three <laughs> that's days awesome. long and you participate from the age of four to 13 and it tells you the history of the company, you know where we came from, how we raise money, the pains that we had in the company. And so every year we do one of these, and the and the grandkids, um, it, we've made we've hired a professional teacher, and so it's, so it's just not us doing it. And the grandkids are really looking for. We've made videos, and yeah, so on. it's awesome. And um, I think it's important. I mean, your dad and you, you, you had, and your uncles, you know, went through all kinds of trials and tribulations, mm -hmm. and sometimes people get on the train at the at the twelfth stop on the track, right? right? And they go, oh, it's always been like this. And right. you go, well, let me let me educate you. So I think I think for our listeners out there, one of the things that's really important is you got to let people know how you got there. Other, otherwise, you ruin them. You know, yeah. they say, "Oh, we're so successful. We make this much money. The company's this many millions of dollars." You say, "Well, no. Let me tell you about how we sacrificed a college fund to make payroll." Right. You know, right. this is the reality. Of the situation, right. How I maxed out every credit card that I owned to the point the bank wouldn't give me a five thousand dollar loan. Yeah. So I think I think it's important for people to know that history uh -huh, and for uh, sure. that legacy. Yeah. So you're, you know, uh, what what is the turnover in the restaurant industry? Oh my God! I mean, it's it's a hundred percent. Really? It, yeah. So with five hundred employees, you're fi you're hiring five hundred people. Well, every year. that's the turnover in the industry. Yeah. So we have a much lower turnover, and 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 we work really hard at it, and yeah. and obviously. Um, you know, we're doing something right in, in, in regards to that because we've been around so long. And right. so, so we have a, and any secrets about what you do or how you recruit or how you retain people? Anything special that you do? Well, I mean, yeah, the things we try to do in all those aspects. I mean, we, you know, we, we try to recruit people who, who you know, have like what I like to call a hospitality mentality. Like right. we try to try to pick up in an interview if it's people that 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 in, get off on on serving others. You know, if right. that's what brings them right. joy of making somebody else happy. And I think right. that's you can train somebody any of the of the tasks of, right. of how to how to wash dishes, clear a table, cook the food pour the drinks, you know, take orders. But I don't think you can necessarily train someone just to have that innate kind of satisfaction that it makes you feel good mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to make someone else happy, to bring joy to someone else. And so that's, that's probably what we're looking for in, in the recruiting process. And, and then, you know, once we onboard people, uh, we're passionate about training and, and, you know, like you said, telling them the stories, telling right. them the history of the company, how we got to where we are. And then, like I said at the beginning, you know, making them feel important. I mean, I mean mm -hmm. to tell you a story, um, so my uncle John, uh, when I came to work as, as a dishwasher, um, when I was 13, you know, he said to me, hey, it's great that you're coming to work and I, I just want you to know we're starting you out in the most important job in the restaurant. Uh -huh. And I said, wow, man. I, I'm going to be a manager. You know, I don't, <laughs> no, I, mean, I knew I was going to be a dishwasher and I'm thinking to myself, uh -huh. I had no idea a dishwasher was yeah. the most important job in the restaurant. And, and I kind of looked at him like I had a look on my face. He said, no, it is. I mean, he's, you need to understand. Um, if, if you don't keep up with the, with the dirty dishes, you know, we can't run the restaurant unless we have clean silverware, clean plates, mm -hmm. clean glasses. Mm -hmm. the, the cooks need clean pans and, and, and utensils. I mean, literally, if you don't do your job, we can't run the restaurant. Yeah. You know, that was my first day of work, and I'm yeah. thinking, whoa. I mean, so. What so, pressure? Yeah, like, <laughs> what pressure? And also, 
I got a really important job. I mean, yeah. I'm a really important yeah. piece of, of this company on my first day as a dishwasher. So I, I'm, I, I came to work every day and was thinking, man, I, I'm important, I got an important job, yeah. and I did that for a year or whatever, and then, then I got like a promotion to busboy. Yeah. And now I'm out on the floor, I'm gonna go out on the floor, and he says, hey, Lindsay, you know, I just wanna let you know, uh, we're moving into the new job, and you know, this is the most important job <laughs> in the company. And I'm kind of looking at him, and he says, you know, I mean, if you don't, like, we got busy restaurants, there's people coming in, you know, waiting in the lobby to get in. If you don't clear those tables and, and, and get, set, get it set for the next, you know, group to come in, someone's going to walk in the door, see this big crowd in the lobby, and they're going to turn around and leave. And pretty soon, nobody's going to come back. So, you, you know, you got to be on it. And I'm thinking, man, I, well, I guess I, first I thought dishwasher was most important, but now I, re I realize busboy's most important. <laughs> and then, of course, the next job I had, prep cook or whatever, same thing. Hey, why do you know? You got the most important job in the company. Like, you got it. So then I, I figured it out. Like, he's going to tell me for the rest of my life that every job I have yeah. is the most important job in the company. And he's right. And, and so, like, that has stuck with me since I was yeah. 13 years old. And, and, and the, the point is, every job is important, right? Yeah. You can't do yeah. it, you can't be successful unless everybody is doing their job. And therefore, every employee in the company is important. Every employee is yeah. vital to the success of the company. The link in the chain. Yeah, and you want them to feel that way. You yeah. want them to feel special yeah. and, and important and appreciated. And so that's what we try to do. We try to make every employee feel like they're the most important employee in the company. Good story. Right? So, good, yeah. good advice. Yeah. Last question for you. What do you think, whoever it was, your uncle, your dad, whatever, what was the one thing, I mean, you've told me a great story, but what was the one thing that you, that they gave you that you think this is the essence of my success? Is it, is it, was it the best job thing or did they tell you one thing that, that you've taken all these years and said, oh, you know, I feel like this has really helped me get through and be a successful CEO. I mean, I would say my dad told me at a young age that, um, that, that the best deals to make in any business relationship, and really in any relationship, are win-win deals. Mm -hmm. And some people maybe grow up thinking, it should be a win lose. Like mm -hmm. I haven't done my job. I'm gonna get over unless, on them. Yeah, unless I get, unless I win. And 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 I think that at a young age, uh, just kind of looking at every relationship that way. So whether it's a relationship with a landlord and mm -hmm. come into terms on the right deal, or the bank, you know, or however you're doing financing, uh, and and even just with 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 employees, just the relationship between the manager and the employee, they got to be win-win. Like in, in any of those relationships, mm -hmm. in order for them to be successful both parties have to feel like they're winning and so I, I think mm. yeah and just in really in any relationship that I have I try to I try to make it a win-win and, and I think that's uh, that, that's such a success. critical uh, I mean it's, first of all it's phenomenal advice from your dad Bill but it's such a critical element because I think sometimes people go in to negotiation with just what's on my agenda right you know what if, if I get all these things will I be happy and really the best negotiations are the ones where you go in and say, what do they want? Exactly. How, how, how can I make them happy? What are, you know, if they walk out of here with these three things, is that going to be good? And if I get my three things, and then you get a marriage that's long term. And so I think that's beautiful advice. Yeah, yeah. No, me too. I'm glad he gave it to me, and I'm going to try to pass it on to everybody else I come in contact with. Lindsay, thanks for being a Seattle legend. Thanks for being yeah, on man. the show. Thanks good so luck much. to you. Absolutely. Thanks, John. All right. We're out. Hi, this is Dwayne J. Clark. Welcome to Walk This Way. I hope you enjoyed this great interview we just had with Lindsay Swartz of Swartz Brothers. Restaurants, bakery, great family legacy story. Three points I want to take out of this interview. Really three important points. One is what is the expectation when you go into a family business? Now, I think Lindsay said something that was really important that I resonated with. He said that in order to have staff respect him, in order to have credibility, that he had to start at the very bottom. So he came in as a dishwasher and then was a busboy and then a waiter. And, you know, they didn't make him general manager of a restaurant right away. That gives you street cred. So I want to tell you a rule we have in, in our family, in the Clark family, about employees working for us that are family members. First of all, if people want to come and intern or take a side job, that's fine. They can do that. 
they're going to probably be the lowest paid person on our payroll. That's important. Second thing is, if you want to make a career out of this as you know for a lifetime, one of the things you have to do, and I'm forced this on both my children, Adam and Ashley, is you have to go work for a billion dollar or more company for two years. Now, I don't care what you role you have for that company. You could be a dishwasher, you could be the janitor, you could be the head of sales. It doesn't matter, but you have to go work for that billion dollar company. Why, why a billion dollar company? Because I want them to bring something else to Aegis Living. I want them to go out and learn protocols or policies or procedures or ideas that they can bring to our company and make our company richer. Again, you've heard me probably talking about the making of the quilt. Each employee that comes brings their piece of the quilt. And so this quilt is made by all these corporations that make us better. So my son went out and worked for Microsoft. He was one of the youngest supervisors of Microsoft when he was 21 years old. Worked for them for almost three years. My daughter went out and worked for Nordstrom's for about five years. And both of them came back and made the company better and richer. So I think it's really important if you're going to have a family owned business that you bring people in at a low level. But I also think it's important that you go out and make them spend those young years working for another company. That also gives them a paradigm of if your company is a great company or a bad company based on the culture that they worked in previously. So very important. That's lesson one. Lesson two, Swartz Brothers went from you know, uh, owning a few restaurants to, to having multiple, multiple brands. They had Gretchen's, the shoebox delivery brand. They had Daniel's Broiler. They had the, uh, the bakery, Swartz Brothers Bakery. They had Kachina Kachina. And they were all over the place in terms of where their company was going. And they even decided to roll out Kachina Kachina so it had multiple locations. And one of the things they made the decision about is when to consolidate all things. I think that was a really smart move. Some of us get you know, caught up in how many properties you have, how many retail stores you have, how many keys you have. Whatever your business is, we get caught up into growth and the masses, quantity. You know, that doesn't make any difference to me. I, I've always said, I don't, want, I don't want to have 500 you know, luxury retirement homes. I'd be happy having them with 50 or 60. Because the 500, you may dilute the brand and they may not even be profitable. So focus on quality, the quality of your operations, not the size of the operations. And I think that's one of the things that, that Swartz Brothers and Lindsay did really well. The last thing that I took out of this interview is what I call repositioning. And this is where I think a lot of people get tripped up. See, we get in love with our business strategy and you operate it for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I have a friend who was a plumbing contractor and 80% of his business was with a large retailer, a, a brand name retailer that we, you would know if I said it. And he's like, this is phenomenal. They keep building these stores and you know, 80 to 85% of my, my business is with this store. And I, you know, I'm making all kinds of money. Well, guess what happened? You probably guessed it. That retail store stopped building. And that was 85% of his building plan, or his, his revenue was 85% of, of his revenue was these stores' buildings. And when they stopped and dried up and said, hey, we're no longer going to use you, they had to scramble. They weren't thinking ahead about, this is the 800-pound gorilla that if he goes away, I'm not going to have any money. So I always want you to think about repositioning. What are the trends? What are the things that are going to happen? What are the things that can help me reposition for the future. And Lindsay did a couple great things. Now, keep in mind, he's a steakhouse. That's really how they made their name, the Swartz Brothers and Daniel's Broiler and so on. And he went from being, a, a, you know, honoring the steak, now he's introducing a whole plant-based diet. You know, even faux meats and so on. So, you know, he's like, I know our customers are changing, we have to change with it. So that's a big thing that he did. But the other thing that he did is he found that these uh, popular bakery goods that he was selling originally to Starbucks, again, they repositioned themselves very well and said, I think I make as much money in my restaurants as I could in this bakery. And their bakery expanded and expanded and expanded. So you have to look for these ancillary things that you're going to be able to do that's constantly going to reposition your revenue platform. And that's one of the things that I think Lindsay and Swartz Brothers, Swartz Brothers did really, really well. So. Three great tips. You know, think about the, the family members and what kind of obstacles 
and requirements that you have for them getting in. Second tip is, you know, don't let your ego drive the size of your company. It's about profitability. It's about your happiness. It's about your passion. It doesn't matter how big you are. It matters how successful you are. And third thing is, always, always, always think about repositioning because things will change. The trends will change. And that's really important. So thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Walk This Way. Tune in next week. Some incredible, exciting advice you, want to, you won't want to miss that will make you better, smarter, and happier. All right, subscribe if you like this podcast. We have much more coming to you.